Good morning, everyone, and hello. Welcome to Lupus and You Answers Advocacy in Action. I am so glad you are joining us this morning, and um, we have a great program, and I'm so looking forward to all of our presentations. My name is Leanna Bennett, and I am a walk manager with the Lupus Foundation of America. I oversee the DC, Maryland, and Virginia areas, um, and I'm here to be a resource for all of you, so please do not hesitate to reach out during or after this program with any questions. First, I would like to thank our presenting sponsor, AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is such a wonderful partner and supporter in many aspects of what we do here um, at the LFA, and we are so grateful for them. Um, We're so thrilled to have them with us here today and a part of today's program. Before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, if at any time you have a general question that you would like to submit to our speakers, you can add it to the chat. We will have time at the end where our speakers will answer any questions you may have. Um, don't forget to mute your microphones. Um, keeping yourself muted will keep the flow of the program from being interrupted and save more time for any questions at the end of the presentations. Um, so do remind yourself to um, keep an eye on your microphone. Finally, this program will be recorded um, and you will receive a link to the recording along with helpful resources and a post-event survey um, where you can submit feedback um, at a later date. So with that, um, let's kind of review our agenda for today. Um, I will start us off by sharing a little bit about the Lupus Foundation of America, some helpful resources and ways that you can get involved. We will then jump into our amazing speakers to present on their topics. Um, and then finally, as I said, we will have the opportunity to interact with all of our speakers doing a Q&A session at the end. And with that, let me get started on more information about the Lupus Foundation of America. So here at the LFA, people affected by lupus represent the heart and soul of our foundation. You are the central focus of everything we do and are a constant reminder of our mission's urgency and serve to motivate us to continue this fight. To put this simply, our goal at the Lupus Foundation of America is to one day end the impact of lupus and its suffering while ensuring that we provide the comprehensive support and programs people with lupus need today. Our programs stand upon three pillars, research, care and support services, and advocacy. We have redefined lupus research to expand our efforts beyond just funding research grants. We are engaging all stakeholders to identify barriers that stand in the way of progress and setting a course to overcome them. And we do this while providing caring support for people affected by this devastating disease and leading advocacy efforts to bring more funding for research and services. Our research is patient-centered and focused on transforming lives. We have three goals, identifying the causes of lupus, discover better ways to control symptoms, and ultimately find pathways to cure lupus. People with lupus are also so important to their research process, and that's why we developed our new online research platform called RAY, which stands for Research Accelerated by You. No one understands lupus better than those living with it, and you can help advance lupus research right from the comfort of your home by participating in Ray. Share your experiences with lupus to help inform future clinical trials of new lupus treatments and identify the most pressing needs of people with lupus. We also have our National Resource Center on Lupus, which will be your one-stop resource for all things. Um, it's a collection of up-to-date resources and information um, so you really can make informed decisions on what's right for you. Um, you can head to lupus.org slash resources to find this. We also have certified health education specialists who are trained to provide people with lupus, their families and caregivers with non-medical counseling, disease education and helpful resources. Um, our health educators can help you find trustworthy information to answer your questions about lupus and how to cope with it. Um, to contact a health educator, you can fill out an online form at lupus.org slash health educator. Next, we have a program called Take Charge, which, which is a 12-week education email series for people with lupus, including those recently diagnosed. When you sign up, you'll get an email from our health education specialist with tips and resources that can empower you to take charge of your health. 
The series covers important topics such as identifying and tracking your symptoms, sticking with your treatment plan, and getting the most out of your doctor's appointments. We have a program called the Expert Series, which is a monthly educational podcast um, where our team interviews experts in the field about topics that are important to you. I personally love podcasts and the series is really informational and such a great form of media for learning if that interests you. Um, we also have more than 150 support groups across the country where people with lupus can come together and ask questions and listen to each other. Um, many of these support groups are still being held virtually, um, but we are so grateful for technology so we can still reach and support this entire community. Finally, you can also join Lupus Connect, which is an online support community where members can engage with each other and ask questions um, while connecting. Moving on to ways to get involved with their organization um, and support the fight to end lupus. One way is through our Walk to End Lupus Now program. We were back in person this year and we're so excited to bring the community back together. Um, many of the walks have already happened in person, but there's still time to join us for our national virtual walk. So please reach out to me um, in the chat if you would like more information about this event. We also have a program called Make Your Mark. It is a community fundraising program and a way to turn an event into a fundraiser for lupus. And finally, your voice is one of the most powerful tools we have. We are the leader in stimulating federal support for lupus, and every day we fight to ensure the government is responsive to the needs of the 1.5 million Americans living with lupus. So definitely look into using your voice and signing up to be a lupus advocate today. As I mentioned in the beginning of the call, I oversee our DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. Um, so if you need anything at all, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, I know there are individuals from other areas here today. So if you are interested, you can find local support um, through our network of regions and chapters. Um, they offer local programming, support, and events. So feel free, feel free to reach out to me if you need any assistance finding support in your region, or you can head to lupus.org chapters. Finally, here is where you can find us. Check out our website um, or follow us on social media, which is a great way to stay updated on all of our programs, events, and services that I mentioned today. I can also follow up with any of these um, as well if you need or answer any questions in the chat. And with that, um, I wanna thank you so much for spending time and listening and learning more about the Lupus Foundation with me. And I now I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, Sydney is a lupus warrior, LFA ambassador, and a DC Walk Committee member and team captain. Sydney, it has been such a pleasure getting to know you over the past year, and I'm so thankful for all you do for the lupus community. Um, so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and really turn it over to you to share a few words with us. Yeah, thanks, Leanna, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me share a little bit about my journey with you this morning. Uh, so I was diagnosed with SLE five years ago in November uh, 2017. And so lupus affects my joints, my heart, and my lungs. Uh, on a good day, I experience, you know, the typical joint pain, brain fog, fatigue. Um, and on my bad days, I experience a lot of difficulty breathing and pericarditis, right? So that's where the sac around my heart becomes inflamed and I, um, it produces like a really sharp pain in my chest. Um, it took at least four years before I was properly diagnosed, right? So I was always sick, in and out of urgent care, seeing several different doctors. I'm sure this probably sounds familiar, familiar to some of you. Um, no one was ever really able to tell me what was wrong with me. Uh, and so, you know, I also at the time didn't have steady health insurance. Uh, so doctors didn't really know me, right? They didn't really know my history, which I think probably contributed to what took so long um, for me to be diagnosed. But anyway, so leading up to my diagnosis uh, was after coming home from a beach vacation in September, 2017, uh, where I spent almost every day laid out in the sun. Um, when I came home, my health just really started to drastically deteriorate. Um, I know now that too much sun exposure is a trigger for me, right? And I think I just assumed that I had like a horrible case of the flu. Uh, and it wasn't really until I woke up one morning and I literally couldn't move, right? It just felt like my whole body was weighed down. I couldn't move my hands. I couldn't move my legs. Um, and I decided that, you know, I probably needed to actually figure out what was wrong with me. Um, 
thankfully at this time I had steady health insurance. And so I had developed a relationship with a, my primary care physician who, after examining me, almost instantly knew that I had an autoimmune disease, uh, right? And so we just set out on this journey, a series of blood tests to confirm and determine what it actually was. And it came out to be lupus. Um, and so now I am on Plaquenil twice a day, every day. Um, I'm, I've only had to be on steroids twice since I was diagnosed. Um, and, you know, I think I would definitely probably say that over the last few years after being diagnosed has been just a lot of me figuring out what works for me, what doesn't, what my triggers are, you know, to avoid a flare, um, how to rest. Uh, you know, I've also had to really just reevaluate what my days look like, uh, cut back on a lot of activities and things that I was involved with. Um, before my diagnosis, I was super busy, very active, always on the go, uh, but very demanding full-time job. I also have a custom cake business that I've since had to cut back on. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, I think I had to quickly realize that I didn't have a lot of energy, right, to continue in the same way that I was. Uh, I had to put pause on a lot of things. Um, and I think for me, my journey with lupus has been more than just figuring out how to be physically healthy, uh, but also just figuring out how to be emotionally well and emotionally healthy, um, right? And just really accepting what works for me and what doesn't um, so that I'm not just living with lupus, but I'm also, you know, having moments of thriving with lupus. And so, yeah, that's just a little bit about my journey. And thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, Sydney. I loved how you ended that with thriving with lupus and um, it has, again, been such a pleasure getting to know you and so thankful for your time today. So thank you again. And um, I will now kind of introduce our next speaker. Um, so Dr. Thomas is an associate professor of medicine at the Uniform Services University, Bethesda, Maryland, and he teaches other doctors about lupus at Walter Reed Naval Medical Center. He is in private practice in Greenbelt, Maryland, specializing in patients with lupus and other systemic autoimmune diseases. He is the author of the Lupus Foundation seal approved book, The Lupus Encyclopedia from John Hopkins Press. He runs a lupus educational blog and Facebook page called Lupus Encyclopedia with over 30,000 followers worldwide. He is a chair emeritus at the Medical and, S and Scientific Advisory Board of the Lupus Foundation Mid-Atlantic Chapter, received the Lupus Foundation's Hero Award in 2016 from the Mid-Atlantic Chapter, was president of the Rheumatism Society of the District of Columbia in 2016, and is a current board chair of the National Board of Directors of the Sjogren's Foundation. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for your time today. We're so thrilled to have you with us and to learn more about this um, topic. I will now turn it over um, to you to get started on your presentation. Well, before I talk about the FDA-approved drugs, I'd like to first tell you about the very first treatment that's ever been given for lupus. And we know that there was this treatment because there was a bishop in the 10th century named Heraclius. He was the Bishop of Liege, which is now in Belgium. And he actually wrote in an affidavit, a sworn affidavit that is that was given into the Catholic Church archives, that he was traveling through Italy in the year 959 AD, and he was struck with a horrible disease. It attacked his insides. He felt like he was dying, but it also caused open sores on his skin and they looked like the bites of a wolf. He actually said that the people popularly ca called this disease lupus, which means, which is the Latin word for wolf. So that's where the word lupus comes from for a disease. That's the very first time it was ever mentioned. Well, the bishop, of course, he could afford the best doctors of the day. And what did they treat him with? Well, what everybody treated diseases with back then, chicken. But not this chicken, no. Every morning they would kill two fresh uh, live chickens, take out their innards, put the bloody carcasses on his open sores. And they did that twice a day. 
Well, the bishop was unfortunately dying from his lupus. So he traveled all the way to Tour, France. And there at the, at the shrine of St. Martin, St. Martin was known for healing the sick. He lay in front of the shrine and prayed for seven days and seven nights that he would be healed. Well, this is a color uh, depiction. For, uh, this is, actually comes from a wood carving from a, text, a French textbook in the uh, 15th century, right around the time of Christopher Columbus discovered America. And we can see the Bishop of Liege laying in front of the shrine of St. Martin. Above him is standing St. Martin and St. Bryce, who is buried next, next door. And then look at the French text. I highlighted in yellow, l'évêque du Liège, the Bishop of Liège, had une maladie qui s'appelle le loup. He had a disease called the wolf. Well, they healed him of his lupus. He woke up the next day and he was so happy. He went back to Liège, Belgium, and he built a basilica, named it after St. Martin for curing him of lupus. And you can visit that very church today, a church that was actually built because someone was cured of lupus. Well, Fortunately, today's drugs, uh, we do have a lot of treatments for lupus. Unfortunately, I can't give this miracle to all my patients. I wish I could. So we're going to talk about not only about FDA approved drugs, but I'm also going to talk about off-label drugs. Those are drugs that are not FDA approved. We're going to talk about which drugs are worse and which drugs are also best for lupus. And for those who are, for, are not in the United States, I know we have some, uh, some other countries here today, so thank you for attending. FDA stands for for the Food and Drug Administration, and they approve medications in the United States for use. Well, the very first drug approved for, lup for lupus was actually a 1948 aspirin. It was approved for the pleurisy and pericarditis and arthritis of lupus, just like what Sydney has. This is what her doctors would have given her, but they would have given her 5,000 milligrams a day. That is guaranteed to cause side effects. It's guaranteed to cause kidney failure, ringing in the ears, uh, bleeding ulcers, and things like that. So none of us ever use it like this. It's not used for its FDA indication today. We do use aspirin in baby doses of 81 milligrams a day. That's just 2% of this indicated dose. And we use it to prevent heart attacks and strokes. In 1955 was the next drug, steroids. Steroids were truly a miracle drug for lupus. Before steroids, most patients died within the first couple years of, of being diagnosed with lupus, but steroids greatly improved the longevity of their lifespans and, uh, and was life-saving. But unfortunately, we also saw all the side effects that became along with it as well. Uh, and we, of course, still use steroids today. On all my slides, you'll see that the white, white font uh, medicines are the ones that we still use with its FDA indication. Drugs such as aspirin, I'll keep in the yellow font, which we don't use that way anymore. 1957 came chloroquine. Chloroquine is to treat malaria. In World War II, we noticed that the soldiers who had rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, they got better when they took their anti-malarial medicines. Chloroquine worked great, but we started to see blindness. It would deposit in the back of the eye and give irreversible eye damage. So the FDA withdrew its FDA indication. We then learned that if you um, <clears throat> we then learned how to make a safer medicine called hydroxychloroquine, which we still use today, much safer than chloroquine. And I'll talk a lot more about hydroxychloroquine later on. Well, we figured out that if you combine antimalarials like chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and quinacrine, that they even worked better. So a drug came along called triquin, which is a combination of all three in 1959. But when people developed side effects, we did not know which drug did it. So in 1972, the FDA withdrew its FDA indication because of that problem and pulled it off the market. In 19, all of these drugs, by the way, were FDA approved before what I would call the modern era. They were FDA approved by a, by a drug act called the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And this Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, it had three principles. Number one, this is all the drug companies had to show to get the FDA indication, by the way. They had to show the chemical structure of the drug. They had to tell how it may benefit patients. They didn't have to prove it, by the way. All they had to do was tell the FDA how it could work. 
And number three, they had to show what the possible side effects were by testing it on animals, not on people, but on animals. And as you can figure out, this was fraught with lots of problems. There were lots of drugs that were FDA approved that were not good, that did not work, and that gave side effects. William Goodrich, he was one of the, he was the chief general counsel of the FDA from 1952 to, uh, to 1971. And, you know, the FDA back then, they could only do what Congress told them to do, but he made it his, his mission to have the laws changed so that drugs would become safer and more effective for the for people and fortunately someone decided to give to do an interview with him in the, in the 1980s and he asked them the question well how did drugs get approved and this is what he said in the new drug applications the way drugs were investigated the doctor from the company would go out into the community with some samples and say to the doctor, I've got this new drug for such and such disease. Here's some samples, try it out and let me know what you think. And then the doctor would write back to the, to the drug company, I tried it out on eight patients and they got per along perfectly fine. I mean, isn't that crazy? I mean, we wouldn't have imagined such a thing today, but that's how it worked. And then along came 1959 and 1960. In Europe, over 10,000 babies were born with horrible limb deformities. And this drug was called thalidomide. It was taken by women to help them sleep at night while they were pregnant. Now thalidomide was actually available over the counter in Germany. And that's how horrible the drug laws were back then. And a million doses actually made it into the United States. But when this started to happen, there was a public outcry. And so fortunately, the next year uh, when this happened, 1960, uh, 1962, the, the uh, Congress passed something called the Kefauver harris Drug Amendment. And that's what governs our clinical trials today. Research trials for FDA approval are called clinical trials. It means the same thing as research. And they had to prove several things. Number one, they had to test drugs in humans, not just in animals. They had to get informed consent from the patients. You know, back before this, people could go into research and be experimented on and not give informed consent. It was horrible. Um, they had to prove that the drugs are effective and that they're also safe. So there's, there's multiple phases to clinical trials. The most important ones are the phase one, two, and three. Phase one is when they test the a, a possible drug on humans and they prove that the drug is safe. Phase two, they look for the proper dosing of the drug and to see what dose would work better and also start to look at if it actually helps the disease they think it's going to help. And then the phase three clinical trials, the most important one. These are huge trials that prove both the efficacy and also the safety. And by the way, many drugs get to pass the phase two trial, but never get past phase three. In fact, that has, that has happened to the vast majority of lupus drugs because lupus is so hard to study and prove that drugs work because every lupus patient is completely different. Well, in the modern era, we have three drugs that were FDA approved through this vigorous process. Benlista called Benlimumab, Lupinus called Voclosporin, and Safnello called Anafrolumab. 2011 was a monumental year. It was the year that Benlista, Benlimumab, was FDA approved to treat systemic lupus in adults who were not under control with standard therapies. Look at it, the last time a drug was FDA approved was in 1959. Modern television sets were just popping up in, in homes in America and Eisenhower was president. That's how long it took. And finally, they figured out a formula to prove that drugs work. Finally, pharmaceutical companies became interested in that they knew that they could put money into research and make drugs. So we thank Benlista for paving the way. In 2019, Benlista proved that it was safe and effective for children with lupus. This is important. Children who develop lupus are much more likely to have severe disease and die from it than adults are, especially when it, atta it, it can attack their kidneys. So proving that it was safe for children as young as five years old was important. In 2020, Benlista became FDA approved for lupus nephritis, where lupus attacks the kidneys. 
This is important because we know that 40% of systemic lupus patients will develop lupus nephritis. It's a major cause of morbidity and mortality. Patients have to go on dialysis and kidney transplantation, so we need great medicines for lupus nephritis. And that, by the way, this is why we ask you to give that urine sample every time you come in to make sure you don't develop lupus nephritis. Well, in 2022, fortunately, Ben Lista was FDA approved to treat children with lupus nephritis. It's the number one problem that we see in kids. The vast majority of them develop lupus nephritis. So fortunately, we have much better medicines coming along. In 2021, February 2021, voclosporin, also known as lupkinus, it was FDA approved for lupus nephritis. The advantage of it is that was, it was pills to take, so very easy in that regards, while Benlista is an injectable medication. I'm not going to talk too much about lupkinus because I'm going to stick mainly to the systemic lupus medicines, the, the medicines that can treat all parts of systemic lupus. Well, just last year in August of 2021, the most recent medicine, anafrolumab or safnello, the new kid on the block, became FDA approved for lupus. Anafrolumab or safnello and benlister, they're both medicines called biologics. They work very differently. Each of them target a very specific part of systemic lupus. When it, when it, before safnello became along, I had 13 patients just waiting for it because they failed every drug to include benlista. So I couldn't wait for it to come along. And fortunately, most of them are doing very well on safnello. Well, we don't just use FDA approved drugs for lupus because most of our drugs are not. Most of the drugs that we use actually were indicated for other disorders, mainly from the cancer world to treat leukemia and lymphoma because these medicines kill off white blood cells. And that's what lupus is. Lupus is a disease where the white blood cells are overactive and attacking the, the body and that's how they work. They're also from the organ transplant um, world as well. When someone gets a kidney transplant, we give them, we have to give them immunosuppressants to keep their immune system from attacking that new organ. And that's how they work in lupus. They calm down the immune system. So these medicines include cyclophosphamide and methotrexate and rituxan from the uh, cancer world, uh, azathioprine, cyclo, uh, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and my mycophenolate uh, from the organ transplant world. And I know that most of you sitting here are taking some of these medications. You know, even though they're not FDA approved, we've been using these for three decades, around 30 years for most of them. And, and I have many patients who are in remission or low disease activity and off of steroids because of these medications. So they do work. So the question is, which drugs are better, the FDA approved drugs or the off-label drugs? Well, the answer is neither one. The reason for that is we can't say that one drug is better than another unless you have something called a head-to-head -head study where you take something like Benlista and you, and you put it up against cyclophosphamide or, um, uh, or let's say mycophenolate, and then you follow them over time and see if the patients do better on one drug or the other. We don't have that study, but I think that will be done within the, within the next few years, and then I'll have a better answer. But I do have some uh, what I would call best drug candidates. And before I do that, I do need to, to give a disclosure. I give a lot of talks um, of, to doctors about lupus. I love teaching doctors how to treat their lupus patients better. And I am on the Speakers Bureau for GlaxoSmithKline, which makes Benlista, Arrhenia, which makes Lupkinus, and AstraZeneca, which makes Safnello. It's important you know this so that you can see that I'm not being biased or prejudiced uh, verse, for these medicines versus other medications. And so it's important I point that out. So my first best drug uh, candidate is hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. You know, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil is FDA approved to treat systemic lupus. And it's probably been studied in more people with lupus than any drug ever, probably in the tens of thousands. And that's because we've had that many research studies over the 40, 50 years that it's been available. Um, probably steroids is the only one that even comes close or might be able to even a little bit more uh, than hydroxychloroquine. In all those research studies, it's amazing the benefits of hydroxychloroquine 
the chloroquine that we see. Look at this list. These are things that have been proven to be effective by hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine inc increases life expectancy, decreases the need for steroids, decreases lupus from attacking the internal organs, decreases blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes. Those are the number one cause of death in lupus patients. It actually decreases infections. The second most common cause of death in lupus patients are infections, but patients who take hydroxychloroquine religiously are much less likely to develop those. It decreases glucose levels. Patients actually have a lower likelihood of developing diabetes when they take hydroxychloroquine. It lowers cholesterol levels. Women who take hydroxychloroquine throughout pregnancy are much more likely to have a good life pregnancy and have a live birth because of it. And then it increases remissions. In 2006, Dr. Michelle Petrie at Johns Hopkins, she took her patients with severe lupus nephritis and she added mycophenolate on top of half of them and, and compared them to the ones who just take, took mycophenolate. What she showed is that the patients who took my, uh, hydroxychloroquine regularly were three times more likely to go into remission. And hydroxychloroquine is the only drug to this day proven to prolong survival. If you're not taking hydroxychloroquine and you have lupus, and if you can tolerate it and not are allergic to it, please have your doctor put on it, put you on it, because it's truly a life-saving medicine in lupus patients. Well, another best drug candidate are those off-label drugs. We've been using them for several decades, and like I said, I have many patients who are in remission or low disease activity and tolerating them very well. They're safe in most patients. Another candidate would be Benlista. Benlista was proven to be effective in extensive clinical trials. There were close to 2,000 people, close to 2,000 in the clinical trials, so they were, those were massive. But more impressively, just two years ago, Ben Lister published a study where they've been following the same patients over time. And what they showed is that the patients who were taking Ben Lister on top of the usual therapies like mycophenolate and hydroxychloroquine, they had significantly less organ damage over time compared to those patients who were taking the usual medications. So whenever I talk to a patient about what medicines to take, I always bring this up because I, it's important that they know the pros and cons of all their medications. And then lastly, one other drug candidate, and that's Safnello. It also went through very extensive clinical trials and the interesting thing is that it works fast. I mentioned those 13 patients that I put on it, and most of them are doing really well. I can't, I won't re forget that first patient. She was an older patient. She had horrible skin lupus called subacute cutaneous lupus all over her body. It was so tender and itchy that she could, she could hardly wear clothes like this. That's how bad it was. I saw her the, after the first infusion, and she had zero active inflammation of her skin and she had failed everything to include Ben Lista. So thank goodness we have much better medicines. Now one medication is the fastest working and life-saving drug. And what is that? Well, steroids. Steroids is, an, is the only drug that works immediately and it's the, it is the only way I can save someone's life when they first come to me with severe lupus. One drug, is guaranteed to increase organ damage. I told you how Benlista decreases organ damage. Well, one drug is guaranteed to increase it. And guess what that is? Also steroids. Even low doses, low doses as low as two, three milligrams a day. There's, there's absolutely no safe long-term dose of steroids these days. We say now that the P in prednisone stands for poison. Today, our goal is to get our patients into remission and completely off of steroids by using any of those other medicines, which overall are much safer in our lupus patients. So, out of all of these drugs, which is the best drug of choice? Well, you know, every lupus patient is different.
If I lined up a hundred of my lupus patients, they would all be different. One may have pericarditis and, and uh, arthritis like Sydney has. Someone else, they may have it attacking their kidneys and have brain involvement. Someone else, they have, may, may have recurrent blood clots. And so, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Plus, there are different genders, different sexes, different ages, different ancestral backgrounds. And so I need to, dis so it's a, fair, it's a very personal decision and it should be made on the basis of what's going on with the patient and a talk to talk about the pros and cons with the doctor. So the best drug of choice is actually any of these. Everyone, by the way, should be on hydroxychloroquine, but any of those drugs I talked about are good for systemic lupus. Well, two years ago, I was able to go visit the, the Basilica of St. Martin in Liège, Belgium. This is it right there. And, and if you have a chance to go there, I would encourage you. It's, the, it's a church that was actually built because someone was cured of lupus. And you can see the body of the Bishop of Liège from the 10th century laying in his sarcophagus there. The first person to ever have lupus receiving the first recorded treatment, which was bloody chicken carcasses placed on his open sores, didn't work. And then he also had the first successful treatment, which was being healed of his lupus by St. Martin. So there are a few points I'd like everyone to take away from this talk today. Today's standard of care in lupus treatment is to get our patients into complete remission or low disease activity and completely off of steroids. If you're not in remission and have not tried all the drugs I just discussed, and especially if you're on even a couple of milligrams of prednisone, please see your rheumatologist and say, I'm interested in trying other medicines to get my lupus under better control and to get me off of these steroids. Dr. Thomas told me that the P in prednisone stands for poison. So your being here today on a Saturday morning proves that you want to be proactive in your health care. Knowledge truly is powerful. Today I'm wearing my, uh, my arth uh, arthritis walk uh, shirt for the, for the upcoming Lupus Foundation walk in order that says be powerful. And that way you can learn to conquer lupus and not let lupus conquer you. And Leanna, thanks for having me today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. I learned so much and I hope everyone else did as well. There's already been some questions in the chat that we will look through and address at the end of the presentation. Um, so again, if any questions come up in your head while you guys are listening to our next speaker, please go ahead and put them into the chat and we will address those. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, Monica Ritchie has been a nurse for 20 years, 17 of them in the field of rheumatology. She received her training at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, where she worked for 10 years and developed several different patient education programs, including cardiovascular disease, contraception, and preventative health prevention for lupus and APS patients. She served as the advocate member at large for the Rheumatology Nurse Society and has participated in several Washington, D.C. meetings, helping to support patient advocacy groups and making the patient's voices heard. She is now part of the Board of Trustees for the Rheumatology Association of Advanced Practice Providers and currently is the Senior Nurse Practitioner at the Division of Rheumatology at Northwell Health in New York. Thank you so much, Monica, for joining us today and for all the ways you support the lupus community. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you if you want to share your screen for your presentation. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for being here. Very excited to be here, part of the group. Um, and great presentation, Dr. Thomas. Uh, you touched on very relevant uh, points. And Sydney, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, I think we all learn from each other in this uh, lupus community. So it's always good to hear what the patient's, the patient's perspective is very important. Today, we're gonna be talking about a couple of things. Um, touching a little bit on the burden of lupus, understanding your immune system, approaching the goals of treatment, and then some future considerations. So, um, so, and Sydney touched really, really well on that part, right? Because um, lupus takes a lot, right, uh, from the patient. So uh, we, as the providers, see you um, once every couple of months, but you live with the disease. So it's always good 
that you have a good open communication with your provider and that he's listening to you. As Dr. Thomas pointed out, not one lupus patient is like the other. Every patient presents differently. Every patient has different complications, which makes diagnosis, and, and Sydney is a, a testament to that, right? It took you years to be diagnosed with lupus, uh, and it takes really a doctor who is really well trained to put that mystery together. Um, and the symptoms are unpredictable. You're really doing good today, and this week is a marvelous week, and then next week, whoo, you have a flare. You don't feel good. You can't do the things. And one of the things that we always have to keep in mind is that lupus have what we call the invisible symptoms, right? Um, you feel tired, but you look great. So your family's like, well, but you look great. What are you talking about? You feel tired, right? You have joint pain. You can see joint pain, right? You have brain fog. So all of this is something that you must communicate. And sometimes there is a disconnect between us and you because we're looking at your blood work and your blood work say, hey, your lupus is well controlled, but you still don't feel good. And sometimes actually it's the opposite where we are panicking it out because your blood work doesn't look good, but you say, hey, but I feel great, right? So lupus has this kind of like unpredictable presentation and, and then you have to have this clear communication and clear understanding between your provider and obviously the support of your friends and family. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do, right? Uh, pain is complicated, memory loss, brain fog. Some people cannot do their jobs anymore or they have to take time off from their jobs. Um, you know, they feel tired. They can't take their kids to school. Uh, they can be the mother. They can be the, the, the breadwinner. So there is a lot that lupus takes from you. So we have to listen to what you have to tell us. And we have to focus the treatment on the things that you're telling me that you need, like, I need to get this back on track. So there is a lot of things that we need to hear more from you. So there's a lot more and as Dr. Thomas brilliantly explained there, right? The last 10 years have been amazing. We have him more medications than ever. Um, there is a lot more coming. The pipeline is very rich right now. There's several different medications that are being tried and tested um, and we need research, right? We need, uh, the research is really the key here. Uh, we can all go to Liège, we wish we could, um, but this is really, really important. And the goals for the treatment is really to minimize not uh, disease activity, reduce steroid use, as Dr. Thomas um, pointed out, reduce organ damage, right? Because you guys start maybe with mild symptoms and all of a sudden you have lupus nephritis or neuropsychiatric lupus. And we, there is not a straight line. It's all over the place. And obviously minimize side effects. So those are the goals that we as the medical community have in mind when we're thinking about treatment for you guys. So over the last 20 years, I'll say there's a lot more research that goes into understanding what is really happening, right? We see the symptoms, we know the presentations, but what is happening in your immune system that is causing that? And we know that within the immune system is the key. Particularly in lupus, there is a lot of studies that show us that there is like a, a for, three things that we always uh, know. For example, there's the genes. And some people have this predisposition. Uh, it's over a hundred genes. It's not one. It's not one that you got from your mom or for your dad. It's really a mix. So that gives a predisposition. Particularly in the case of lupus, sex counts. 90% of patients are women. So we know that estrogen plays a big role on the development of these crazy cells that are attacking your body. And then we know the environment and Sydney brilliantly pointed out that sun is not your friend, right? Sun exposure is one of the main triggers of lupus, but it's not just the sun. We know that it takes years for you to actually develop lupus. There's a several studies that show you have the markers for lupus 10 years before you even develop the disease, but you need that trigger. You need that sun exposure, uh, that infection, uh, pregnancy, stress, any kind of environmental chemicals, exposures to chemicals. So there's very different environmental issues that, that can trigger it, but it's kind of like a bomb set to go and you just needed that trigger, right? In case of Sydney, it was the sun exposure. What is happening with the immune system that is making this all go uh, at the same time, right? As I said, it takes years, it's not one thing. 
So if we look at the immune system, we have all those cells, right? Um, and you should think about your immune system as the military. They're there to attack things, to eat things and destroy things. That's basically uh, the function of our immune system. Um, and most of the time they live happily ever after uh, and they all communicate with each other very well. Uh, they all do their jobs, they all do their function and everything goes according to plan. You have the macrophage here in the center because we know that the macrophage is one of the cells that go crazy in lupus, right? And there's a lot of treatment that goes on to try to calm down the macrophage. There's two parts or three parts to the immune system. One is the innate immune system, and that's the, the immune system you were born with. When you're a baby, you came out of your mom, you already have cells dying to defend you. Your adaptative immune system, it's more complicated and takes years, almost four years to actually be fully function. Those cells have to be exposed to different viruses, to different bacteria, to be able to actually be effective. And then there is these three cells that lie in the middle that make a communication between the innate and the adapta adaptative. Macrophage, again, is at the center of this thing, right? And then you have the dendritic cells, and the dendritic cell goes over here and see what the neutrophil is eating. And then it goes and tells the T cell, hey, the neutrophil just ate that. What do you want me to do with that? It's a constant communication between the two sides of the immune system. And if something goes wrong, if one of those cells are not working properly, if they stop doing what they're supposed to do, and the macrophage sometimes in the case of lupus, stop cleaning, right? Um, the macrophage is a big garbage uh, truck. It clears dying cells, it clears debris. Uh, if there was a battle with a bacteria and a virus, he goes there and he clears it. In the case of lupus patients, the macrophage is not really working really well and it stops doing it and it starts to accumulate debris. So garbage is kind of like your garbage truck one on a, strike and you have all these debris that are irritating your immune system. The one cell that keeps everybody together happily ever after is the regulatory T cell. And the regulatory T cell has an important function, which is to tell your immune system to shut up and go home, literally. If there is a battle against a bacteria and the battle is over, the, T, the regulatory T cell goes there and say, quiet, it's over, go back to your normal function. But sometimes because there is a lot of irritation in the immune system and you have this predisposition and your T cells are kind of like, eh, maybe I'm not really done. Maybe I need to do something else. The regulatory T cell loses control of the immune system. And then the T cells start telling the B cell to make auto antibodies. And those auto antibodies are key in lupus because that's what we see. Those are what we call it the immunocomplexes, which is where just massive amount of autoantibodies that are attacking your skin, they're attacking your brain, they're attacking your kidneys. That's why we see when we do a biopsy. And then this dysfunction between the B cell and the macrophage make everything goes crazy. And the regulatory T cell says, I cannot do anything anymore, right? And then it's really when you see that your lupus become active. There is a whole process. It's not one day. It's not just because you went to the beach one day that you got lupus. It's not because you had one baby that you got lupus it take years for this process to really culminate and that bomb really explode. So as I said, everybody has a function, right? So the, the, the macrophage is there to eat things and destroy things and clear things. These other cells, you know, they have these cytokines that all the cells communicate with. It's like their Facebook, Twitter. So this guy, tweets to this guy, hey, I just eat that, can you send me those? But we in the immune system community call them cytokines, IL-6, IL-12, IL-23. Those are inflammatory cytokines, right? It's very complex and they go back and forth and there is cytokines that say, shut up and be quiet. So there's all of these communications being going on, but this really trigger when one of these guys just messed up and start doing what they're not supposed to do. So, so your immune system in lupus, there's two parts of them, they're not really working. There's the macrophages and the adaptative is like lost control over it, right? And then you have those autoantibodies really attacking it. 
And the goal of treatment in the end, as Dr. Thomas pointed out, is to actually calm it down, bring it back to a normal working environment where you don't have those crazy autoantibodies functioning around. Lupus is one of our diseases that can attack literally every part of your body, right? It spares nothing from the blood, the kidneys, the heart is a big target in lupus. Even the eyes can be affected, uh, brain, skin, lungs, even the intestines. Uh, there is something called lupus enteritis, which is actually a complication of lupus and obviously the joints and the muscles. And then you have this fever and this fatigue that comes on from all this inflammation that's going on, which you have no control over it, right? So it's a systemic disease. It spares nothing. So one of the targets of uh, treatment right now uh, is targeting this specific cytokine called type 1 interferon. And that's a messenger that says signals between here and there. Um, the B cells uh, that produces the autoantibodies uh, stays in the body longer when you have type 1 interferon running around. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It makes like, well, no, we, something is going on here. It's usually only released when you have viruses going around. But in the case of lupus patients, you have more interferon in your blood work for some reason and that creates this B cell to continue to make autoantibodies, right? And then the T cell also get activated by this whole interferon cascade. So there's a lot of research going on to discover what drives lupus, right? So the interferon is one of them. And many patients with lupus are well known to very heavy, high levels of type one interferon. And that's because they have a genetic predisposition to make more interferon. In research trials, we actually check interferon levels. That is not something that we can check on a clinical basis. Your insurance will not pay for this particular test. But during some research for certain particular drugs, we look for the, the gene signature for interferon one, right? And we know from research studies that this gene signature is elevated in lupus patients. So there is a lot more research going on to understand why lupus patients have this high signature gene expression. So the approach to treat, and I, and I, I struggle with that with every patient of mine because you're great today and you're feeling awesome and then you're feeling really crappy tomorrow, right? You're flaring. But let's say you have a good run, right? I had this patient that I haven't seen for a whole year, just didn't come to the clinic. She was feeling great and she thought her lupus was gone. We know that is not true, right? We know there is always a lower ending inflammation going on. And that's why we don't want you guys to like no show up, stop your medications, even when you feel good, because when you're feeling good, right? There's still an underlying inflammation going on that we know is there. And if we don't treat it and if we don't really keep it down, you're going to flare again. And then when that flare comes in, it could be your kidneys, it could be your brain, it can be your heart. So this up and down, up and down is a normal, uh, unfortunately, uh, thing that happens with all lupus patients, right? You have these periods of disease that is very quiet, and then you have massive flares. The goal, as Dr. Thomas pointed out, is to reduce organ damage in the end, is to really stop this activity. The more flares you have it, the more active your lupus is, and the more accumulation of organ damage is happening, right? And if you let it go, if you just take your prednisone whenever you need, and you don't come, and you don't take the other medications such as hydroxychloroquine, it really makes it difficult because you're really not controlling the disease. So the traditional, before belimumab came in the market in Safnello, the traditional way to treat lupus was anti-malarial, steroids, immunosuppressives, and non-steroids or anti-inflammatory, the aspirin, right? Or naproxen or whatever to treat the joint pain. And then after uh, 2011, you start to having more targeting where you actually have 
what we call it biologics coming into the lupusine for the first time where we had biologics for RA over 10 years before. So it took 10 years to actually get our first biologic um, for lupus. So what's the difference? The traditional is a catch it all, right? Um, I don't target a specific molecule or I don't target specific cytokine. I catch everything. I make your B cell, your T cell, your macrophage, I make everybody come down, right? They're more immunosuppressive drugs. They kind of lower your immune system in an overall sense. They're not really targeted specifically for lupus. And with the target therapy, then you have um, Safnello and Ballista really targeting specific cytokines in your immune system that are making it crazy. So you have a different approach. You're really quieting down where the problem is versus that catch it all kind of net. The aim in research and for the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies is uh, to address this unmet needs in lupus, right? Prevent organ damage is number one, right? Um, it's kind of like avoid you from getting lupus nephritis, avoiding you from having heart disease. That is the goal. The goal is not just to get you feeling better so you can get back to work, it's really to stop the progression of disease. We have that in other diseases. We have that in array. We have that in PSA. We can prevent the disease to evolve. In lupus, it's kind of like, this is a necessity because we really have a lot of uh, organ damage with this particular disease. And then we put you in control of the disease and not the disease in control of you, which is happening many times where you like doing great and you get back to work and then a month later you crash. So it's really a, um, new way of looking at the disease. All right, future considerations. And I'm gonna have a lot of time for questions because I think that's the most important, right? So you have to set up when you're sitting with your doctor, what are your goals? What do you want to address? You know, some patients say, hey, my address is to get my lupus under control and I wanna start a family. Some is like, I wanna get back to college. Tell your doctor, tell your provider, if there is a nurse practitioner, a physician, a PA, right? We're all into this uh, rheumatology now. So you have to be very clear what your goals are so we can address that and make sure that everything that I do is to actually get you not just to control your disease, but to get you where you wanna be in your life. We need to address diversity because Minorities are the ones who get the worst lupus, African-Americans, Asians, Latin and Hispanics, Native Americans, right? They get the worst lupus. Caucasians get lupus too, but it's usually not as severe. So we have to address the diversity issue. We have to get a minorities to sign up for trials so we know what drugs work for you and what drugs doesn't work for you. So it's very important to include everybody in the treatment, in the trials, and, and in the spread in, within the community for so all, everybody has the resources that they need. And then, you know, because it's like, I looking at a patient, right? I'm not really worrying about your, your career at that point. I'm working of, of worrying about your blood work and your kidneys and everything. So we need to find something that is a middle ground. But yeah, you're not worried about that. You're worried about, you know, I have my life outside of this office and I need to continue to live my life to the best that I can. So we need to find measures, right, of clinical success that are good for me and for you, right? And for that, we need to hear your voices. We, you need to, to participate and tell us what kind of measures really tell you how you're feeling. So this is how it happens. You come in, I do your blood work, and then, you know, I look at the blood work, and then I'll tell you, we'll need to do this, you need to do that. You know, your complement levels are low, your double stranded are low. Those are things that you need to actually ask your doctor to explain to you because those are the terminology that we use to measure success. We look at your blood work, we make sure you don't want anemic, that your lupus is not super active, that your kidneys are safe, and then we make treatment changes, right? That's on my end. And then, you know, we'll say, hey, how are you feeling? but we don't have a real measure for it, for lupus measure, right? We have some patient reported outcome measures, but we need one that is more specific to you. And then we have disease measurement tools, 
sleet eye, you know, things that we use in clinical practice to measure how well you're doing. And those are mostly used in clinical trials and your insurance company wants to know about them, right? Because that's what they go, okay, so I'm gonna continue with this medication and the insurance company send me the disease measurement to tell me how that person is really is. And that's what they look at is the disease measurement tool. And that's how they continue to approve your drug. So when you're talking to your physician, when you in front of him, this is how you have to be very open, tell him exactly how you're feeling, right? Um, understand your lab work, right? If you can, uh, because as I said, you guys don't match your lab work sometimes, sometimes you do, but most of the times it's either one way or another, you're feeling great, your labs look horrible, you're feeling uh, horrible and your labs look good. So um, if lab work is not the exact science here. And then if you tell me you're feeling better, but your blood work is still not looking good, we can negotiate, right? It's like, okay, maybe we can reduce the prednisone, right? And that's that negotiation. Um, never stop your medication before talking to your doctor. Don't play around with it. Don't go on and off prednisone because then you're doing more damage than you can. There's a lot of my patients that try to do that, but I think just come and talk to me. Let me know how you're feeling. Let me know if you're having any side effects, right? I need to know because I'm giving you the drug, but you're living with it. I need to know the side effects. So um, if you're feeling bad, I gave you a medication and you're doing great for period of time, I can start lowering the dose of the drug. So the patient reported outcomes are things that we measure, such as fatigue, such as joint pain, emotional health. There's different ones. Um, there is rapid three. There is several different ones that are really more patient focused, um, but we need one that is more specific really to SLE. So the key takeaways, yes, we have many advanced, we have more coming. The last decade has been amazing for lupus and but we need more, we need a lot more, right? We understand more today about what's happening in the immune system than we ever did. Um, and those are very useful targets for medications. And that's why we must understand what's going on with the Institute. Disease activity can affect your whole body. And even though you may not have any activity and you had those periods of remission, believe me or not, believe me, lupus is still there, right? So we need to make sure you're coming to the office, you're taking your medications, even though you feel good. And the physical and emotional aspects of lupus are connected, right? You as stress, you get stressed, your lupus flares is a direct connection within the immune system. So we need to be able to measure those to the patient's reported outcomes. And with that, we're gonna open for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Monica. Um, it was a wonderful presentation and I learned so much. Um, the chat has been blowing up with wonderful questions and great answers um, by Dr. Thomas. And um, if, again, if anyone has any more questions, please do throw them into the chat and we'll get to as many as possible in the time today. Um, Dr. Thomas, I know you have been really active in the chat. Has there been a question that you answered in the chat that you'd love to provide um, a little more of a robust answer to? Um, and if not, I can definitely just get started in a question that I have flagged. Um, but I wanted to give you the time there to maybe elaborate a little more if you want it. No, I think that's good. I, I think we can go into other questions. And, and please take advantage of us this morning. Uh, Monica is a great nurse and Sydney can give you the patient perspective. So we're... we're interested in hearing your questions. Wonderful. So a question that I think will be great to start us off with today um, is the question of how do you know if I am in remission? I think that is kind of a great place to get us started and I'll collect some other questions as they come through. Uh, sure. So, so there's two major things. There's what you feel as the patient and then we as the healthcare provider, what we see on physical examination and lab work, 
and uh, and and other testing. And Monica kind of brought this up um, as well. But every patient is different. For example, Sydney, she, when she has a flare, she's going to feel very tired. Her joints are going to hurt. She's going to have chest pain when she takes in a deep breath because of her pleurisy. While someone else may get horrible mouth sores, tenderness of the scalp from a discoid lupus, and a cough from inflammation of the lung. So you really have to learn your body. That's one of the most important things. And then we do the physical exam to see if we can see inflammation. I'll listen to Sydney's chest and heart, see if I can actually hear crackles and, and the fluid around her heart or lungs. Um, I'll feel the joints to see if there's any inflammation. I'll use my my ultrasound machines to see if I can see inflammation of the joints. Um, so a thorough exam is important. And then the lab tests, like Monica brought up, you can feel perfectly fine, but on your blood test, I, if I see a very low platelet count from your lupus and you feel normal, you're at high risk of getting a bad bleed and that can be incredibly dangerous and even that deadly. Lupus nephritis, people have zero symptoms. They feel perfectly normal in the early stages, uh, but we see that protein building up in the urine and that's when we want to catch it so that it's much easier to get into to remission. Um, so the bot and bottom line is for remission, we want all of these things to be completely normal. Uh, we'll allow a few things like the anti-double strand of DNA to look, be a little high, the complements to be a little low, that's, that's okay, but we want to get rid of everything else. Another very important thing to point out is that we have A symptoms and B symptoms. A symptoms are all the things that lupus caused by inflammation. Those are the most important as far as using all the medicines I mentioned and suppressing the immune system. But you also have B symptoms. B symptoms are not due to the inflammation of lupus, but they're due to other problems, but they're just as important to you. And that includes overall body pain, fatigue, uh, uh, what we call lupus fog or difficulty thinking. Unfortunately, those do not respond to the usual lupus medicines. We have to use other things uh, such as, uh, unfortunately, things like antidepressants, nerve pain medicines, exercise, uh, proper sleep, and more diet. So it's really quite complicated, but it's a great question. Perfect, thank you so much um, for that in-depth answer. Um, another trend of questions that came forward were side effects from the various drugs, um, including organ damage. I wasn't sure if you could kind of elaborate on um, any of the side effects that we should kind of be aware of or just know about. Uh, sure. One very important thing is your doctor doesn't want you to have any side effects at all. One of the biggest mistakes I see, because I'm very active on social media, is people will send out these things saying, I feel horrible on this medicine, but why do I have to keep putting up with this? We don't want you to put up with it. Please send us a patient portal message or call us right away because we can usually get rid of the side effects um, by going down on the dose or stopping the medicine, changing it to something else. Side effects are anything that you feel badly it's usually soon after you start the medication, and, and they're almost anything, uh, feeling sick, uh, having nausea, having rashes that were not there before. And then on blood work, we're, we're always monitoring the medicines to make sure the medicines don't irritate the liver. We look for elevated liver enzymes. Sometimes it can cause the blood counts to go low. Uh, fortunately, with as close as we follow medicines, we can, most of the vast majority of these things are mild and we can get rid of them by changing changing the medicine around, but please don't put up with side effects. We have too many good therapies these days. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, a question that came through was about um, Plaquenil. Um, does the effectiveness, effectiveness of Plaquenil decrease over time um, with use? Yeah, the good thing about Plaquenil is it doesn't decrease over time. I saw Monica shaking her head. I agree with her. <laughs> yeah, but what can happen is that your lupus can become more active. Lupus is a disease that we call waxes and wanes, has periods where it gets worse, periods where it gets better, and hydroxychloroquine by itself is not always the best treatment. Every little flare that you have, we want to get rid of it, like Mark Monica said, because even mild flares increase the risk of organ damage. So if someone does have increased disease activity while they've been on hydroxychloroquine a long time, that's a, that's a sign to me that I need to add something to it. 
or I need to make sure you're taking your medicine. I'll check a hydroxychloroquine drug level because that's the number one reason for hydroxychloroquine not working. 45% of you watching this missed doses of your Plaquenil. We know that because we checked your drug levels and we've proven it through multiple studies. Please religiously take that hydroxychloroquine, never miss doses. There's a huge difference in my patients who miss their doses and those who do not. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, a question that also came up were some more like at home or lifestyle um, changes. So someone asked about apple cider vinegar for lupus as well as saunas. Have you heard that from any patients or um, do you have any kind of advice about those kind of topics? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about lifestyle. Uh, lifestyle is just as important as um, uh, as the medications. And that's the whole reason, by the way, why I wrote my book, uh, Leanna, The Lupus Encyclopedia, because there's so much in your power. Don't just take the medicines. Uh, that's not going to do the trick. Uh, what you mentioned with the supplement, uh, there's no proof that that works, but there are some things that do have a good medical research behind them. For example, turmeric has some very good evidence. Uh, ginger supplements uh, may be beneficial. Vitamin D is an essential. When vitamin D levels go below 40, the immune system works abnormally and disease activity increases. So most of our patients absolutely must be on a vitamin D supplement. An anti-inflammatory diet might work. If you're not sure what to do, just go to my website, thelupusencyclopedia.com and just type in diet and I have some good articles about anti-inflammatory diets. Uh, vitamin E is essential. Vitamin exercise, I mean by vitamin E. A re recent study by the NIH, fascinating. They took patients with horrible fatigue and lupus. These were non-exercisers. They forced them to exercise. What they showed is that the exercise actually caused their abnormal mitochondria. Uh, in our cells, we have uh, an organelle called mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of the cells. The exercise actually caused those abnormal mitochondria to become normal. It's amazing. Exercise actually improves the immune system. And then, and then vitamin S is one of the most important vitamin sleep. We know that if you get seven hours of sleep or less per day, it actually increases disease activity. Family members of lupus patients who get less than seven hours of sleep are much more likely to develop lupus than those who get less. So all of those things are incredibly important. They help the immune system. I want to add something to Dr. Thomas. Whatever you're taking, let your rheumatologist know. Don't take supplements without discussing because you don't know what is in the supplement sometimes uh, and if it's going to interact with any other medications. Um, so um, bring your bottles with you if you want to take it or send a message. I'm planning to start this. If there is something and I have some patients that showed up with Chinese herbs that I don't know nothing about, I'm going to shut you down. I say, don't take it because I don't know what the ingredients are. So uh, whatever it is, bring it to us and we'll let you know if, if it will work okay with your medications. And Monica is per exactly right about that. For example, echinacea increases the immune system. People take it for colds, but it will it can cause horrible lupus flares. Um, mung bean sprouts and alfalfa sprouts contain an amino acid called L-cannabinine and can flare up lupus. If you take too much turmeric, it can cause hepatitis. And so really important to bring all these up. And, and Sydney brought up about avoiding and learning her, what her flares are and avoiding those. Um, I'd encourage you to go to my website and go to the lupus secrets page. I have actually I have a list of do's and don'ts, things you should avoid and things that you can do. And it includes a lot of those. You need to figure out your flares. The Lupus Foundation, by the way, has a great website or a page about lupus flares. Uh, just type in um, just type in Lupus Foundation flares and they have a wonderful um, uh, forum that you can fill out along with your rheumatologist to learn what to do with flares and how to prevent flares. And, and uh, it's just a really, really good handout. So kudos to the Lupus Foundation. Perfect. Thank you so much both for chiming in on, on those treatment plans and great reminder to really talk to um, your medical team and work hand in hand with them to find the best treatment for you. Um, 
A question that came up, and I know we spent a lot of time talking on systemic lupus, but would you be able to touch on discoid lupus at all today, um, just briefly on any treatment plans or just kind of what you've seen as well? Uh, sure. So discoid lupus is, uh, uh, most lupus patients will have skin involvement. And the skin is one of the organs, by the way. Um, if someone just has skin involvement, we call it cutaneous lupus. Um, but if they have any other organ that's involved, then they have systemic lupus. But some patients will have just cutaneous by itself, and discoid is one of them. Um, with Cutaneous lupus, we have three different types. There's acute cutaneous lupus. Acute means it comes and goes very fast. That's like the malar rash or butterfly rash. And then on the other end of the spectrum is chronic cutaneous lupus, and that's where discoid lupus is. Chronic meaning that it's there a long time. Unfortunately, it can cause permanent damage to the skin and scarring. Discoid lupus, we call it discoid because it, it's in the shape of a little disc. Um, anybody know the singer Seal? Uh, Seal, if you ever look at him. He has a lot of marks on his face. It's because he has severe lupus, uh, discoid lupus, where it attacked his skin and caused permanent scarring. When it happens in the scalp, it can actually cause permanent damage to the hair follicles and cause permanent loss of hair. It, it loves to affect the, the ears as well. It's that rash that we want to get 100% in remission because as long as it's active, it will destroy the skin. And then that's just horrible for the person because it's associated with a lot of self-esteem problems because, you know, all of us want to look good and, you know, be, you know, have intimacy and things like that. So don't, don't minimize uh, the skin involvement from lupus. It's just as important as the internal organ involvement, but we always want to get discoid into remission. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, this question was answered in the chat, but I want to make sure everyone did see it. So the question is, how often should patients be seen by their rheumatologist? Um, and I'll, I'll tell you mine and then I'll let Perfect. Monica answer because it's probably different from doctor to doctor. I, I am a firm believer in every three months religiously and all pay, almost all patients because of that lupus nephritis. It can, even though it's most common initially in the first few years, it can happen after 20 years of having lupus. And the only way I'm going to know is when you give me that urine sample and I look for protein in it. So that's what, what I like to do it. I will see patients more more often if they have active disease and I want to get them under control more quickly. I have just a few patients that I spread out farther than the three months. And those are patients who have been in remission in a long time. They're perfect with their medicines and they and they just have very, very mild problems from their from their from their lupus overall. But that's a very small minority. Monica, what do you guys do with, with Dr. Fury? Exactly there? what do you do? Uh, if they're flaring, we see them more often. If they're under control, I prefer three months. For the people who are in remission or you think it's in remission or leave out of state, uh, sometimes I let it go every six months, but I still ask for a blood test in between. Uh, so at least I have something to look at it, even though I don't see you in person. I think you probably agree with me that this whole telehealth has helped been tremendously and keep in touch with those patients that can come in uh, as often as we want them to. Perfect, thank you both um, so much for, for that input. Um, it's a great reminder. Um, all right, so I think we got through a lot of our questions. Um, Dr. Thomas, a question has come up a few times just about your book, availability, where to find that. Um, we can also follow up with resources and websites. Um, after um, the event as well via email, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of share more where they can find those resources from you. Uh, sure. So uh, I'd recommend going to my website, thelupusencyclopedia.com. I have a lot of free information on there. So I think it's really important that I empower, empower patients to take better care of their health care because there's a lot you can do on your own just type things into the um, into the search engine and then this is uh, my book called the lupus encyclopedia it's not showing up very good uh, but it's a, a it's a 
pretty thick book, lots of information in there, and it's available from Amazon. But try to get a used copy, much cheaper than the new copies. But the because uh, I do want everybody to be able to get you know be able to afford uh, getting this. We're writing the second edition right now. Uh, that'll be out probably in the fall of next year. So we're really excited about that because there's going to be lupus experts from all over the world in charge of each chapter. So the second edition is going to be even better than the first edition. So thanks for asking, Leanna. But go to lupusencyclopedia.com, free information. And I'm going to be giving th away three of my books, hardcover books, December the 1st. So if you uh, sign up for my email list, uh, I'll put you in the drawing. Wonderful. Um, I did notice that GL, um, you have your hand raised. I wasn't sure if you put your question in the chat already or if you wanted to um, kind of ask your question now. Um, Sorry, I missed your hand being raised. That's okay. Um, I actually put my questions in the chat, but thank you guys. Um, one uh, point that I need to kind of share, some of the patients have been diagnosed early in life, and I'm finding through the chats that they're having a lot of difficulty, as would most people, trying to develop their own, I guess, way of handling this. I was diagnosed when I was 60 something, having had a career in healthcare. I don't know how I would have handled that part of it. I'm still having a problem getting my hands around the socialization or lack thereof. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that? Because that's a big part about emotional health. I think this is great for Sydney. Yeah, um, you know, any day now. <laughs> I feel like I'm still trying to figure it out. I've been diagnosed with lupus for five years now. Um, I think one of the things for me really is just, first of all, being really honest with myself about what I can and can't do, and then being honest with, you know, my community and my tribe and my people. Um, I think trying to maintain emo emotional wellness and emotional health is again just knowing what my triggers are and being okay with that and accepting that um, I do work out a lot Dr. Thomas was talking about this I after I was diagnosed with lupus I started to work out um, I don't do cardio I'm I do more of strength training and um, like uh, weightlifting I spend a lot of time at the saunas I think somebody mentioned that earlier um, just whatever I can do to keep my stress levels down um, is what I try to focus on and really just being honest with, you know, myself about what I can and can't do. And I think that uh, nobody wants to have chronic illness, right? You know, forever. Um, I also don't have anyone in my family who has lupus or an autoimmune disease that we know of. Um, so I kind of was just out here figuring out by myself with the support of the Lupus Foundation, honestly. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. I think uh, just really any day now and just doing what I can when I can and being honest with myself when I can't do something. I appreciate that because that is one thing that I'm trying to, I just shared with a group that I've been associated with and they, they didn't understand why I kind of just dropped out um, or would only do the virtual things. And I finally told them this year, and again, it's been five years for me. And I said, look, I said, my niece and I had a very frank discussion. I couldn't attend my sister's funeral. Um, and I, it just bothered me. And I finally told her this year what was going on. And so I said, well, I said, what I'm going to do is I said, I've changed my perspective. I said, I am not a victim. I'm victorious. And I said, I'm going to be an AI warrior. She said, what's that? I said, that's autoimmune disease. And I said, it's not just lupus. It's a whole lot of other folks out there. So <laughs> that's how my persona has been developing. She's been encouraging me. So it is better for us to share, but we have to be more forthright. But it, I feel a lot lighter having shared with everybody now so they know what's happening. But I was never the person who got sick. I was always preventative. I mean, I spent 28 years calling on doctors and hospitals and dialysis units, never had a problem. I retire or semi-retire, and all of a sudden, I said, well, what is this? I can't move. And I didn't know what a flare-up was until I was diagnosed, but I'm grateful. I've got a great team. I do have a naturopath along with my rheumatologist, 
and they get along famously. So I am extremely grateful for the short period of time between having the beginnings. Uh, again, I had them before, but with the Vernose disease, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was cold hands. But it didn't manifest with the quote unquote big guy, the lupus, until five years ago. So thank you guys and appreciate all the research. Thank you so much um, for your question, for, for speaking up today. Um, I think we do have someone else who just raised their hand, Natalie, if you wanted to um, to share or if you wanted to put your question in the chat. No, I uh, I really appreciate this. I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I joined at 11 o'clock. I was, you know, I, I had something else before that I, a conflict. But anyway, I have a 21-year-old daughter who was diagnosed last summer. And I need help on making her, uh, you know, I, I don't think she's avoiding it, but like I'm trying to get her into these seminars, these webinars. I'm trying to make her understand that, you know, there is no one else. Oh, I'm sorry. There, there is no one else in our family that we know that has. And so I just need help in how do I, how do I engage her? in realizing that, you know, there is hope, you can live a normal life with lupus. And, um, you know, she's getting checked right now every five to six months through blood work. Um, she is on the, um, I can never pronounce it, the hydrochloroquine. Um, her blood levels have been going down, but it's still there, you know, and I, as a mother, I'm just concerned and I want to help her as best I can. And Sydney, Thank you for, I'm so happy I could listen to what you said because you are hitting home for me as a mom, but um, I just want her to know there's a community out there that she can reach out to and that she can live a normal life with this. Um, I was devastated when I found out last year as well. And I want to be a, um, a, a source of support for her, but right now I just don't know what to do uh, so I just wanted to find out if I could get help from any of you all in how to engage her into these webinars and make her understand that you're not alone, you're gonna be okay. Yes, you're 21, but you still have a full life ahead of you. She's a terrific young woman. She is a fantastic student, a fantastic person, but I just can't cut through with, with this right now with her. What can I do? Can you, can you give me some guidance? Thank you in advance. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. And I think a lot of people can probably relate um, to you. We have plenty of resources and I'd be happy to connect with you um, after this event. Um, we also have support groups for caregivers. Um, I would love to kind of put you in touch with that as well. I think that would be a wonderful resource for you to help guide you through this journey as well. Um, I'm not sure if anyone, Sydney or Dr. Thomas or Monica. I think that all three of us could give some insight Perfect. on this one. Um, Crystal Boy, I, I sure feel where you're coming from. As a physician, I have to say that I feel powerless a lot of times with my 20-year-old patients. They, they tend to be less compliant and more likely to not take things as seriously, unfortunately. Most of them do great, but unfortunately, I had those ones who, who don't, and I don't know how to get through them either, except through, I just try to educate them over and over again and, and, and show them what's going on and, and, you know, try to, try to teach them about their disease. I've had some patients I've seen for over 20 years and I re remember how they were horrible when they were in their twenties and now they're just, they're just amazing as far as what they do. But I would love to hear Sydney's and Monica's um, uh, thoughts on this because uh, as a physician, I, I feel like the way you do sometimes, because I, I feel like sometimes I feel like they're my children and I want them to do well. And, and it really breaks me apart when they don't. Thank you. Thank you for your help with that. Yeah, Natalie, this is Sydney. And I think just um, from a patient's point of view, or, you know, in my own opinion, I think, you know, your support is awesome, right? And that's, uh, for me, again, 
I didn't know anybody who had lupus. No one in my family had lupus or an autoimmune disease. And it was a it was a blow to me, right? Um, and then it was a blow to my family. But I think one of the things that empowered me to get involved with the Lupus Foundation and to feel empowered to talk to other people about it and to do my own research was one, my rheumatologist uh, kind of forced me to, but then also my family um, and my friends, you know, I had a really good community who we learned together, you know, we didn't know a lot about lupus. And if I'm, if I can be honest and frank, there was a big stigma about what lupus was, right? Especially in the African American community, growing up, you hear lupus, you think, oh my God, right? And so we didn't really talk about it. And um, I think when I was diagnosed, just having that support system, um, you know, my my mom, she would come to me and she would say, hey, I, I looked this up. What do you think about this? And just having that conversation, that open discussion was very helpful for me. And it really empowered me to learn more and to, um, I don't think I, I, I would say I, I have settled into my chronic illness, but it really did help me to kind of, you know, um, just come to terms with uh, what it is and what it what it will mean for my life forever. Um, so I guess I just say all of that to say that keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, I was diagnosed in my 30s and I was still just like, ah, right? Um, so I don't know that it, the age really matters. Uh, it's a blow, um, but it's not the end, right? So I think just, what, you know, whatever you're doing, just continue to do that um, until, you know, your daughter feels uh, empowered to, um, you know, do what she needs to do. And then I'm also a resource, you know, I love talking to people. Uh, so I wouldn't mind, you know, if you want, if we, if you like for me to connect with your daughter, I, I talk a lot if you haven't figured that out yet, but um, thank yeah. Thank you so much. I, I might take you up on that, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the answers. And again, I'm sorry, I'm making this go over the time frame, but uh, I just, I need to understand and I'm just trying to do the best I can as a parent. So thank you all for your advice. Yeah, I think I agree with both uh, Dr. Thomas and Sydney. Community is the key word here. She needs a lot of support. And one thing that I see with all my lupus patients and that initial phase of denial, right? Nope, I don't want that. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to know about that. And all patients go through that. Um, having somebody that is your age to talk to and has the disease makes it a lot easier. So connecting her with other patients who are going through the same may ease the burden because you're too close to her, right? Your mom and you are the best for her. And that sometimes is even more difficult for her. So connecting her with Sydney or anybody who is her age. And we see that, you know, I think the Lupus Foundation may have some support group for young people who are targeted um, will help her tremendously uh, to start to understand the disease and what she needs to do. But um, a, a good relationship with her provider is uh, also really good. Somebody who can listen to her, understand where she's coming from, her age group, right? She's in college, she has her whole life and now she has to deal with it. And that usually is no, uh, no mixed situation. But I think you're doing the right thing by trying to find her support, by being there for her. And then the rest, she's gonna have to kind of you slowly gear into the lupus, but connecting her with a younger person um, will be the key word thing here for her. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of your thoughts and advice. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, a reminder that this event was recorded. Um, so we'll be following up with. Um, the recording um, and additional resources. I know a few people have asked about support groups, so I can be sure to include those resources or ways to find um, those items in the follow-up email. Um, I just added to the chat um, our post-event survey, um, as well as you can scan this QR code. Um, feedback from today's event is um, so valued and really helps shape future programs. So I'd love to know what you thought of today's um, event and what type of content you'd like to see for the future. Um, and again, thank you so much for all of you for joining and huge thank you to um, Dr. Thomas, um, to Monica and to Sydney for joining us today. Um, it was a wonderful presentation from all of you and a really 
really great and powerful to see all of the questions and answers um, for this presentation. Um, so again, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. And um, I will be in touch soon and please feel free to reach out if you need anything at all. Um, thank you again. And I look forward to talking with you soon. All right, bye everybody. Thank you. Keep bye. up the good work. Thank you, thank you be, so much. Be all. proactive in your healthcare. <laughs> thank you.